Something that's always kind of confounded me in popular music is people's inability to take humor seriously. And I think that's one of the things, like, why a band like Sparks isn't as big as the biggest bands in the world. Because they're fucking funny. You had sense, you had style, you had cash galore. A lot of critics and some fans uh, sometimes denigrate bands that show their sense of humor. Like, oh, it's a comedy band, it's a joke band. I just don't get that. I don't know why it has to be so stinking serious. I thought it was going to be a smash hit album because it was so different. And anyone could see that we spent hours of work and put detail in it. And the songs are so great. And Russell's singing was amazing. The world just didn't agree with us, you know. It did well, but not that well. We were so irate at just lack of acceptance for what we thought was an amazing album that we were seriously considering recording Louie Louie as our next single, you know, just for spite. All right, and this is for Focus Generic. What was your initial reaction when Edgar Wright approached you about making a documentary focused on your lives and career? Was there a specific aspect of Edgar's pitch that made you want to get on board or most attracted you to the project? Well, when Edgar Wright approached us to do a documentary about Sparks, we were literally floored. We're huge fans of Edgar's work his films, and we'd been so hesitant to do a documentary in the past because we felt that we hadn't been approached by the right person that was really on the same wavelength as Sparks is and who could really tell the story in the same sort of way, in a visual way that uh, Sparks is uh, musically. And we, we had always been fearful in the past, but when Edgar proposed this idea, we were over the moon because we thought, how could it go wrong? And Edgar Wright film about Sparks, it seemed like it would be perfect. And the one final thing that really convinced us uh, for sure was the fact that Edgar was going to treat all of our periods in an equal way, that, it, that he wasn't going to kind of focus on some mythical golden age from the past. But, but his feeling was that what we're doing now is as essential as what we've ever done before and if, when he when he mentioned that we said yes very enthusiastically where do we sign the next question is were there any specific aspects of your career that you knew you wanted to highlight in the documentary that you felt were important what we were happy with with uh, Edgar's approach to the documentary was that he, in fact, included every era of Sparks' career. And that was one main concern before setting out to do this was that it wouldn't be that it would maybe be focusing on one era or another era that some people might say, oh, that was there. That's the golden period or that's the golden period. But in fact, Part of Edgar's thesis was that there are many, many, many golden eras of Sparks uh, throughout our career, and that that some of the some of the periods even that were lesser known are maybe equally interesting in their own ways. And so we're really happy that Edgar chose to treat all of the eras of Sparks equally. And the next one. The documentary has several funny moments. What tone and style did you hope the film would have overall? Well, the one thing that really uh, pleased us immensely when we finally saw the final cut of the film was that it was an Edgar Wright film. That Our concern was that, that stylistically, the film might be toned down from, from Edgar's usual uh, exuberant way of, of making films and and to our mind this this really seems like it has the stamp of of Edgar on it even though it is a, his first documentary so that that was you know a very pleasant surprise I mean we, we probably shouldn't have been 
surprise. We, we definitely didn't want it to be uh, just a, a dull gray documentary with people yapping, but to have, you know, a real Edgar Wright cinematic flair to it. And, and it, it did that in spades. Was there anyone featured in the film who you were surprised to find out was a Sparks fan? When Edgar finally showed us the final cut of the film, we were so excited by all of the uh, various creative types that he got to speak on behalf of Sparks to, you know, speaking out very eloquently their, their um, you know, their liking of, of the band. And we were really surprised because we haven't had contact with any of, with the majority of the people in the film and, you know, from actors like, Mike Myers and his Patton Oswalt, uh, to writers like Neil Gaiman, to uh, TV producers like Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan Palladino, and then the wide breadth of musicians that Edgar included in the documentary from various genres of, of music, you know, from going from Duran Duran to the Sex Pistols and kind of everything in between, Jack Antonoff who produces Taylor Swift, or it just it was sort of all over the map, and we were just so happily surprised that all of these uh, wonderful creative types uh, wanted to speak out about Sparks. It was really heartwarming for us to see them. All right, and this is for Focus Generic. What was your initial reaction when Edgar Wright approached you about making a documentary focused on your lives and career? Was there a specific aspect of Edgar's pitch that made you want to get on board or most attracted you to the project? Well, when Edgar Wright approached us to do a documentary about Sparks, we were literally floored. We're huge fans of Edgar's work, his films, and we'd been so hesitant to do a documentary in the past because we felt that we hadn't been approached by the right person that was really on the same wavelength as Sparks is and who could really tell the story in the same sort of way, in a visual way that uh, Sparks is uh, musically. And we, we had always been fearful in the past, but when Edgar proposed this idea, we were over the moon because we thought, how could it go wrong? And Edgar Wright film about Sparks, it seemed like it would be perfect. And the one final thing that really convinced us uh, for sure was the fact that Edgar was going to treat all of our periods in an equal way, that, it, that he wasn't going to kind of focus on some mythical golden age from the past. But, but his feeling was that what we're doing now is as essential as what we've ever done before. And if, when, he, when he mentioned that, we said yes very enthusiastically. Where do we sign? The next question is, were there any specific aspects of your career that you knew you wanted to highlight in the documentary that you felt were important? What we were happy with, with uh, Edgar's approach to the documentary was that he in fact included every era of Sparks' career. And that was one main concern before setting out to do this was that it wouldn't be, that it would maybe be focusing on one era or another era that some people might say, oh, that was there, that's the golden period or that's the golden period. But in fact, part of Edgar's thesis was that there are many, many, many golden eras of Sparks uh, throughout our career and that that some of the, some of the periods even that were lesser known are may be equally interesting in their own ways. And so we're really happy that Edgar chose to treat all of the eras of Sparks equally. And the next one, the documentary has several funny moments. What tone and style did you hope the film would have overall? Well, the one thing that really uh pleased us immensely when we finally saw the final cut of the film was that it was an Edgar Wright film, that our concern was that, that stylistically the film might 
be toned down from, from Edgar's usual uh, exuberant way of, of making films. And, and to our mind, this, this really seems like it has the stamp of, of Edgar on it, even though it is a, his first documentary. So that, that was, you know, a very pleasant surprise. I mean, we, we probably shouldn't have been surprised, but we, we definitely didn't want it to be uh, just a, a dull gray documentary with people yapping, but to have, you know, a real Edgar Wright cinematic flair to it. And, and it, it did that in spades. Was there anyone featured in the film who you were surprised to find out was a Sparks fan? When Edgar finally showed us the final cut of the film, we were so excited by all of the uh, various creative types that he got to speak on behalf of Sparks to, you know, speaking out very eloquently their, their um, you know, their liking of, of the band. And we were really surprised because we haven't had contact with any of with the majority of the people in the film and you know from actors like Mike Myers and his Patton Oswalt uh, to writers like Neil Gaiman to uh, TV producers like Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan Palladino and then the wide breadth of musicians that Edgar included in the documentary from various genres of of music, you know, from going from Duran Duran to the Sex Pistols and kind of everything in between. Jack Antonoff, who produces Taylor Swift, or is it just it was sort of all over the map, and we were just so happily surprised that all of these uh, wonderful creative types uh, wanted to speak out about Sparks. It was really heartwarming for us to see them. What is your what is your earliest memory of being introduced to the music of Sparks? My earliest memory of Sparks is watching the British music show Top of the Pops, which I guess I started watching when I was like three years old. And um, in 1979, when I was five years old, I remember seeing Sparks on the show because they cut a very distinctive, <laughs> like they were very distinctive looking guys and they're also staring down the camera at you which is quite disconcerting when they're kind of sandwiched between happy smiley pop acts so i remember the visuals of sparks and then separately from that my parents used to buy me and my brother these ktel chart compilations on vinyl with like these kind of 20 track albums 10 tracks aside and one of them had beat the clock by sparks on it so then at the tender age of five, I was listening to Beat the Clock by Sparks a lot and not necessarily understanding the lyrics, but really enjoying the vibe of it. Not that I would have known what the word vibe meant when I was five years old. So it was something that that alone was like the start of an obsession. And in a pre-internet age, it was very difficult to kind of gather information about like a band that you liked, especially a band like Sparks who were pretty enigmatic. So it took me a long time to find out more about them, but they kept coming back into my life. And I guess by like maybe about 20 years ago, around the time that they released Little Beethoven, you know, it turned into a full on obsession at this point. And so I think with each passing year, my sort of admiration for them has just grown and grown because they keep releasing like albums that are as ambitious and inventive as anything that they had done when they started. Considering you've been a fan for so long, what motivated your decision to create the documentary at this time and not earlier in your career? Why did you feel their story needed to be told? That is a long question to repeat at the start of the answer. <laughs> um, why I wanted to make the documentary is because I felt that they, why I wanted to make this documentary is because I felt that Sparks as a band did not have the trajectory of any other band that I could think of. Like most bands who started in the seventies may have like had their golden years in the seventies and then started to sort of tail off and have that kind of like rise and uh, then fall, rise and fall and rise again. 
and Sparks has sort of got a very sort of strange career where there's sort of like a career of like constant ups and downs and left turns. And then amazingly, they just seem to be making stuff that's as good as what they did in the first place. And, but it keeps getting bolder and more ambitious and they don't seem like daunted by anything. They sort of found like a way to exist where they don't have to really answer to anybody and it's an odd thing to see a band who are in their fifth decade to still be gathering younger fans. So seeing all of that happen and being at gigs of theirs with a really diverse age range to the crowd, I just felt that there was theirs was a story that needed telling. And then last question, how did you first meet Ron and Russell and what was their reaction to you wanting to make a documentary about their lives and career? Um, I'm starting to flag, sorry. Um, so the first time I got in touch with Ron and Russell, well, the first time I met Ron and Russell was, was quite magical for me <laughs> because like after having been a fan of theirs for decades and then being somewhat enigmatic characters and, you know, with a lot of rock stars, you don't even think that they live on planet earth you don't you know think that they actually exist in the real world but one day in 2015 I was writing Baby Driver and my friend the screenwriter Michael Bacall was in the office with me and the conversation turned as it frequently did with me to Sparks and he knew one song and I said oh you've got to listen to this album so that very quickly turned into a Sparks marathon and then whilst we were listening to a lot of classic Sparks I said, oh, I wonder if Sparks are on Twitter. And so I looked at their Twitter page and it said, Sparks follows you. And this was major because to me, they were like the JD Salingers of rock. So I just like messaged them immediately said, hey, is this actually the band? I'm such a huge fan. And Russell replied, said, yeah, this is Russell. We love your movies. And then within 48 hours, I was meeting them for breakfast and uh, at Russell's house. And that was amazing. And then it was a couple of years after that, I'd seen them live a couple of times now. I saw them with FFS at the Wilson in Los Angeles, which was just extraordinary. And I was like, just dumbfounded by how great Russell's voice was and how like they, as a band, were sort of keeping up with Franz Ferdinand, who had the energy of a band that were like, you know, from 30 years younger than them. And it was sort of extraordinary to witness. And then a later gig in 2017, by this point, I'd been saying to anybody that would listen, somebody needs to make a documentary about Sparks. You know, Sparks are the greatest, most influential band that don't have a documentary about them. So I kept saying this out loud, not necessarily thinking that I was gonna make the documentary, but at this 2017 Sparks gig, Phil Lord was the person, my friend, the director, Phil Lord, he was the person who said, you should make that movie. So I said, yeah, I will. And then I mentioned it to Ron and Russell that night. And they said, we'd love you to do that. They then said that like they had over the years had other requests to do a documentary about them and had said, no, I didn't, wasn't aware of this. And so that was kind of ironic because I, as a fan, I'd been aggrieved about the lack of a Sparks documentary. But very nicely, they w were willing to trust me to make the movie. And so three and a half years later, futureprevews.com. Go behind the scenes of movies. Subscribe to Future Flicks YouTube channel.